Now, there's one third thing that I need to mention, and that is actually the starting context of our of our real hypothesis testing theory that we use. So the classical hypothesis testing that uh, we apply in the in most of our science at the moment. Um, what we tend to do is we provide a directed hypothesis. Now, we are strong advocates on saying that this is not the correct way to go forward. This is an example of a directed hypothesis. Controls and patients exhibit identical maximum knee flexion of 30% stance during walking. Now, very often, that hypothesis actually doesn't exist before you start your uh, study. Very often, the studies that we tend to do in biomechanics in particular tend to have an explorative nature. In a sense, what we do is we measure, we observe, we focus through our observation to something, and then we actually will do a comparison between our conditions on that particular focal point. Yeah? So we, we are biased by our observations to focus on something that is a particular aspect of that um, movement. But really, our hypotheses don't tend to be directed. Strictly spoken, this should be our hypothesis. Controls on patients exhibit identical knee kinematics during the stance phase. That means we actually need to examine all three planes, and we need to examine from 0 to 100% stance, without being biased by a subjective focal point that we've, we've got from observing our data. Because this is the critical thing. It's a very subjective thing. It's not a wrong thing, necessarily because people might have a very good expertise and very good insight in what's going on in guiding them toward a certain focal point, but ultimately, statistically, it's not a correct thing. So the scope of the null hypothesis should not be changed after seeing the data, really. Now, this is important because this justifies the use of something such as statistical parametric mapping in many of our experiments. If your experiment does have a very specific focus for example, through a pre-experiment that has identified that that's the focal point, and then you will focus only on that, then what you should do is only measure that. And not go back towards again measuring 100% of your data and all three planes, focusing again, refocusing, and confirming whether something applies or not. So, what is then the treatment? So what is it really that uh, we think will solve this problem? Um, so the treatment is, as you can imagine, the statistical parametric mapping, and so I need to tell you where it comes from. It was originally developed for analysis of cerebral blood flow from three-dimensional MRI or functional MRI scans. And so what these images uh, here, you're very familiar with that. Some people even are measuring that at, at the moment in time. And so that was where there was a guy called Carl Friston who actually came up with combining random field theory in this whole context of this data and, and, and try to see can we use random field theory to actually come up with something that can help us deal with this data. So we needed an n-dimensional methodology. We needed it to be suitable for smooth and bounded fields, which this is also the case. So blood flow also cannot vary randomly between adjacent locations. It has fields of, of increased or decreased blood flow. Yeah. Um, it's something that was extensively validated, the random field theory in the past, and now actually Friston's publication, the first publication on this methodology, Statistical Parametric Mapping of 1995, has more than 6,000 citations. Uh, I think we need to go and look for a long distance before we will find someone with an equal amount of citations on one single paper. Um, and if you actually type in SPM in Google, you'll have a lot of results on that. So it's a very, I would say, extensively used technique in other fields, but biomechanics. In biomechanics, it's only still in its infancy at the moment, and we're trying to obviously change something about that. Um, what are the particular advantages uh, of SPM for biomechanical data? The fact is that you don't have to discretize, you don't have to reduce your data, which could potentially be biasing your views. And I can tell you, if you look at this here, just at first sight, which of the two different things there do you think have more meaning, has more meaning? At first sight, I'm pretty sure that most of you would probably say the second one here. Yeah. That's more different between those two groups than the first one. Well, when we apply statistical parametric mapping, and this is the first time that you might see this here, then what we can actually see is that the level of significance is the same between those two. 
And why is it? Because intuitively it was very difficult for you to actually take two variables into account. You took into account the separation here. You looked at the separation and you thought, ah, on the right hand side there's more separation. But what you didn't do is you didn't look at the variation actually. There's a very simple statistical principle. Our statistical <coughs> principle, our t-value, is calculated by looking at the difference in averages over the variation between those. And what we notice is that, coincidentally, at the time there, in this first instance, although the magnitude of differences may be not as big, the variation is smaller, which means that actually, therefore, your t-value and your critical threshold is crossed in the same, to the same extent. So that's where we have no need for discretization and it allows us for non-directed hypotheses because now we can actually observe an entire movement and do hypothesis testing on that entire movement. We can also provide non-abstract representations. Remember the visualization that we had of the tables and the other kind of uh, visualizations? Well, in this case, if I show you this, then this is a sagittal plane flexion extension angle uh, during a particular task. Two groups, while well, this here shows in parallel underneath it at the same time where the differences between groups are. Again, would you have guessed from your intuitive observation, although maybe it's not data that you used to look at, that here the biggest differences occur? This is very difficult to judge because it's actually on a slope. And if you observe two graphs on a slope, the distance exactly on that slope is very difficult to interpret from your graphs. Yeah? And so that's where the largest differences occur compared to when we would typically do our tests. There was also a significant difference at a peak value. Yeah? But you can see that the visualization is very intuitive. The same with these pressure data. This here is a statistical result. What it is, it's a t-value comparing two conditions, for example. And the t-value, if it is positive or negative, then it has a different color. So we can see now, for a particular time frame, and we can make this vary over time, for example, but we can now see for the entire footprint where the differences are. We don't have to divide zones, and you can see that here, there is actually a negative difference, whereas there and there there's a positive difference without having to artificially cut zones. <coughs> Imagine if you cut zones that cut across some of these boundaries, then you will average two different zones together and you will actually remove your effect. Yeah? If you have an effect in the negative direction, effect in the positive direction, you average them, you will ultimately remove your effect. So you will miss out on potentially relevant information. The final thing is then the 3D, this is the same thing, so we can plot on a 3D uh, dimension the statistical output as a t-value, and it's a statistically correct output. It's not a repetition of t-tests every time, no, it's actually a t-value calculation, which is a descriptive calculation of our data, average over standard deviation ultimately, taking your degrees of freedom into account, but it then allows you to calculate the probability of being a meaningful or significant effect based on inference that uses random field behavior, taking the smoothness of those random fields into account. So it doesn't actually take a decision based on so many different pixels and then correcting for some one for only to make sure that you don't apply um, a, 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 a statistical error in your decision making. No, it actually uses the full field to decide on that, this, on, to make that decision of uh, your meaningfulness. So, to summarize the basic principles then, before we go to the examples, we tend to have non-directed hypotheses, we tend to explore data in 1D, but then actually analyze the data in 0D, and we have very often interpretations from very abstract representations in the fields. What we really have is we have 1D data, or 2D data, or 3D data, or ND data, name it, which is smooth and bounded. And the solution is that we can calculate an alpha 4 smooth bounded data. This is the real essential difference. We can avoid, therefore, data reduction and avoid that focus bias that we might have.
and we can facilitate contextual interpretation. So we can actually contextually interpret our data based on how we present the data typically. Now, allow me to finish off the basic principles with one further example to, to hopefully show the point. I'm going to ask you, this is a picture, right? I have done what biomechanists tend to do. They reduce their full picture to try and make an interpretation of what the full picture is. And they reduce it down. What I've done is I've actually reduced it down to three discrete points that are focused on, which I found were very useful to identify what the picture is. So can anyone tell me what this picture tells now, what this shows? Well, I would have been very surprised if anyone had said beforehand that this was Sean Connery in his Scottish dress. Yeah. So this is an explanation of our reduced presentation of data and how it does not allow us to really get a full picture if we have to do that. Because you have to remember, you as a scientist, you, you will have seen the picture. You will have reduced the data down because you thought, ah, I need to show the Scottish dress. I need to show the beards, and I need to maybe show the jacket, which is what I had. But if you then present that data, then you have to remember that ultimately that presentation does not show the full picture anymore. And so your presentation of your data, your reporting of your data, will lead to a very different understanding of what the full picture is. It's obviously anecdotal, and I have no particular uh, uh, affiliations to Sean Connery, so let's move forward to some examples, perhaps.